God whose will and knowledge and majesty reach out beyond our farthest imagination. God who loves us so intimately that we may feel your presence in silence. Be with us now. Lord, we would see Jesus. Therefore, I ask that I may diminish and he may increase. These words of my mouth, these meditations of all of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength. We were actually going to get out of the Gospel of Mark, did you? You know, after last week, you know, we we gone through we gone through three different tellings of the story of John the Baptist. Well, the Gospel of Mark is, is really short. It's a really short gospel. So in order just to just to maximize the material, just to get this far in the church here, and we're not that far along, you have to go through everything about three times. And then and, and finally, I guess the the, the, the writers of, of the Revised Standard Lectionary decided, well, okay, that's enough with Mark now, so let's just Throw everyone right into the Gospel of John. And throw us. They did. Uh, uh, just, just a couple of thoughts about uh, the Gospel of John. Common scholarship generally believes that the Gospel of John was the last of the Gospels, the four canonical Gospels, the last one to be written. Uh, the typical date given is about 90 AD, which would put it uh, more or less more or less in the midst of, of the reign of the Emperor uh, Domitian. Who, uh, if anybody isn't really into history, especially into Roman history, you would know that he was a particularly harsh emperor, especially when it came to dealing with the Christian community. Uh, even though the Gospel of John, we call this the Gospel of John, I do this all the time, I do this every time I read it, the Gospel according to St. John, the authorship is, is anonymous. It is self reported to, to be based on the testimony, the testimony of John the Apostle, who actually was the author who actually sat there, wrote this down, and composed the phraseology of it, beyond the fact that they were acting under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we don't know that person's name. The other thing you might want to know, just to keep in the back of your mind, is that the Gospel of John was most likely written for a large Jewish audience. Uh, by 90 AD, the word had gone out to, to many, many Gentiles, but there was still a large Jewish Christian community. People today we might refer to as Jews for Jesus. They kept all the Jewish traditions. They kept the Passover. Um, they, they looked and acted and went about their business like Jews in the kosher homes, but they were believers in Jesus. There was a Christian Jewish community, a fairly large one, and it's believed that this gospel goes out mostly to that community. Um, so here we are, and uh, right in the second chapter of John, this is early in the ministry of Jesus. If you were to look back, uh, Jesus just began his ministry, and uh, the first thing that Jesus does, the first miracle that Jesus does, according to John, one near and dear to my heart, I shouldn't tell you that, but it is, Jesus goes to, hang, goes to a party, and what, what does he do there? He takes, this, he takes this wine, and after mom comes up to him, and says, but son, they have no more wine, and, and after complaining, mom, what does this have to do with me? He, he um, honors his father, his father, his mother, and uh, turns the water into the best wine that he ever tasted. However, not long after that, uh, our text goes uh, and, and tells us that it is now the Jewish Passover. It's now the Jewish Passover. And um, uh, Jesus goes to the temple, which would have been a, a customary thing to do with the Passover. He goes to the temple, and uh, an event takes place. And I just want to point something out, um, because unlike a lot of preachers, I, I love these things. I, I really do. I actually love these things. The first three Gospels are referred to as the Synoptic Gospels. They're called the Synoptic Gospels because they most likely come out of the same original material sources. They also tend to be written uh, earlier. By the way, Mark, who we've just been living with for the past couple of months, is typically believed to be the earliest of the Gospels. Um, uh, they kind of place this story at the end of Jesus' ministry. Now here, John decides that this story belongs at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Now, I, I will tell you that a lot of preachers uh, uh, shudder about that and, and, and all, kinds of, all kinds of thoughts and scholarly gymnastics as well. How can this, this be? And me, I just absolutely 
delight and paradox. It's, it's one of the things I, I plan on asking. When I get to the other side, I have, I have, I have so many questions. This one is right up there with um, a, a guy. What's up with the platypus? You know the platypus? I mean, the platypus. I mean, what were you thinking? And, and, and the other, uh, what were you thinking? This is going to be, I will tell you, one of those what were you thinking kind of things. Here is Jesus. He is about to preach love. He is about to preach nonviolence. He comes up to the temple. He comes up to the temple. You know how the story goes. He sees, um, he sees a bunch of merchants in the temple. Why were the merchants in the temple, by the way? Why were the merchants in the temple? Didn't they have any idea? What? You know, there are people that are selling things. There are people selling doves. There are people selling cattle. And all of their money changers. You think, you think somebody just came along and said, oh man, the temple courtyard. This is the only thing they need here, a pet shop. The business of the temple was sacrifice. The business of the temple was sacrifice. And by this particular point in time, the understanding was that the sacrifice needed to be absolutely perfect. Perfect as was designated by the Jewish religious establishment. Perfect sacrifice. Where do you get such an animal? You get it from merchants who are authorized to raise and keep such animals. Money changers. Why were the money changers in the temple? Do you know? Thank you. Very, very good. Very good. You, 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 got, you got that. Yes. Um, so the leaders of the religion said, okay, even though Rome built us this temple, remember this is Herod's temple we're talking about. By the way, it's not finished. It's been under construction for 46 years. And it's going to take decades more to complete. Take decades more to complete. This is a very, very large building project. It's a very, very large building. Well, it was fine for Rome to build us a temple, but we don't want their money. So this is some of the background. This is some of the background. Jesus comes upon this scene. This has been going on a long time. Jesus sees this thing, and in modern parlance, he goes postal. He just goes postal. I'm, I'm sorry, I know that's not very reverent, but he goes postal. He goes in there, and he, the first thing he does is he, he makes a he makes a whip. Anybody have a picture of Jesus on, on, your, on your wall at home? Did you grow up a picture like that? I grew up a picture like that at home. You know, it was sort of, I, I can't call it Nordic Jesus. Yeah, he had, you know, this beautiful flowing blonde hair, blue eyes, and kind of aquiline features. I'm just trying to picture that Jesus holding a whip. So Jesus makes this whip, and he, he drives out the animals. He drives out all the animals, and that's not enough. Then he goes ahead and he turns the tables over, and he throws the coins all over the place. By the way, this story is sometimes referred to as the cleansing of the temple. I don't know you. Um, that's, that's not my idea of cleaning something. It, it really is, but I don't know. You know, this is, this is a little bit like, hey, Norman. How do you like to let me clean your car? Oh, buddy, I'm going to clean your car. I'm going to use this here sledgehammer, Norman, to clean your car. What do you think? I mean, that's kind of what this is like. Jesus goes in, pulls the cleansing of the temple. Jesus goes in there, he turns the tables over, spills over the couch, and he says, we've got animals all over the place. We've got, we got people running for their lives. And um, we're, we're, we're left with this story. So I, I guess it is. I'm kind of on my... What were you thinking, Jesus? For one thing, we preachers are going to be left for the next 2,000 years to sort this out. We're going to have to figure out why you did this, Jesus, because I'm sure you were thinking something. Why? Why? Well, the story, of course, has come down to it, and I'm obviously not the first person to tackle this story. Everybody has to tackle the story at least once a year if they're following the lectionary. Um, and, and what I will suggest to you, and maybe you've heard this, is that this story has been used by a lot of people to justify violence. And people have used this story to justify everything from kicking people out of church, to going off to war, to capital punishment. And, and I'm sure, I'm sure right now, or at least in a few hours, there'll be somebody in that land gloating. What you gonna do now, preacher? What you gonna do now? You've been preaching all this love stuff, all this peace stuff, all this <clears throat> non-violent stuff, and now we got Jesus tearing up the courtyard. How are you gonna justify that? How are you gonna talk your way out of that one, preacher? Well, 
But I will immediately say to that is how anxious we are. How anxious we are to create a God in our own image. How anxious we are to cast Jesus in some pleasing image to ourselves. How anxious we are to allow God to justify our behaviors. Well, that doesn't necessarily answer the question, but let me just suggest my first premise in discussing this text, this story is not an excuse for violence. This story is not an excuse to treat people poorly. I, 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 had, I had to wrestle with this one. I, I, really, I really did. I looked at this at the beginning of this week and I said, oh, that story. Oh, well, here we go. That story. And um, every, every year I get something a little more out of it. Uh, every year I struggle with it. Uh, I, I got done with this this afternoon, not long before I came here. And after dealing with it, I, I felt like I, I felt like I wrote a marathon. Now, all you have to do is take one look at me to say I'm not a marathon kind of person. But I really felt this is what marathon runners must feel like, at least at the lecture, I'm trying to try to wrestle with this thing. But here is what I believe the Holy Spirit gave me. Jesus comes upon this scene, and the first, and I believe, indisputable fact about this is that Jesus is what? He comes upon the scene and he is angry. Indignant, yes, so that's, 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 the, that's the sophisticated word. <laughs> yeah, he is, he is angry. It's another word that comes to my mind that I won't use in church, but he, but he is really angry at this situation. He, he's really angry. And um, I'd like to suggest the first, the very first thing, before we worry about any of, anything else, is that it's okay to be angry. It really is. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be unhappy with things. It's okay to look at our world and to recognize that it's not right. You know, there's, there's a great industry in our world about making things right. Have a little bit of pain? Take a pill. Have strange thoughts? See a doctor. Huge industry. Now, don't, don't misunderstand. I'm not, I'm not putting down... Um, down uh, pain management, I'm not putting down the psychiatric uh, profession, but I am suggesting that our world doesn't want us to be unhappy. Our world does not want us to be angry. And, and I believe that the very first thing we can get out of the story before we delve into the rest of it is that there are times when it's okay to be angry. And I'd like to point you to, um, just to understand that properly, would you turn please to Ephesians 4? Ephesians 4, um, verse 26. Since the pastor just said it's okay to be angry, I, I really, you know, I, for example, I don't want Norman going home and he gets to the doorman and, and, and you know, he, he decides he's angry, so he punches the doorman in the face. And then the doorman says, Norman, why did you do that? I, I, I thought you were a Christian. And Norman probably says, well, I am a Christian, and Jesus was angry, and, and the pastor said it was okay to be angry, so I hit you. Um, I don't want to give you that impression. And, and before I say anything else silly, let's look at what St. Paul has to say about that. Uh, chapter 4, verse 26, it reads, In your anger, do not sin. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. The implication there, brothers and sisters, is that it's okay. This was formally translated, um, and perhaps somewhat better, usually I, I don't like some of the old translations because they were, but the older translation in some ways was probably somewhat more accurate. Be ye angry. Present tense. Be ye angry, but sin not. In other words, it's okay to be angry. But don't sin. There is a difference. And then Paul gives some very practical advice. At some point, you have to let that anger go. Do not let the sun go down your anger. You can be angry, but at some point, you must relinquish that anger. And that brings us to the next point. Jesus was angry. Jesus was angry, and you'll notice what he did not do. He did not go and say, Oh, I was going to go to this temple and listen to what the rabbi had to 
I'd say that, ah, oh, these people with dogs, I hate dogs and sheep and, ugh, oh, I hate this stuff. And then he went and he complained to his friends and he complained to his parents and he complained to everybody else. I'm not going to tell them anymore, it makes me angry. Instead, Jesus did something. The anger motivated him to do something. And then he yelled. But before I get into that, I, I want to ask you the question. What was it that made Jesus so angry? This is very uncharacteristic behavior. Jesus, this is, this is the place where we really see Jesus absolutely furious. Look at the market. Sacred, okay, sacred place, it wasn't a market, it's okay. You sure? Sure seemed like a market, I don't, I don't mean to be disagreeable here, I don't want to make you angry, but it sure seemed like a market. I mean, you know, you had people, they had, they had cash registers, and they had cages full of animals, and they had people exchanging currency. Yeah, and Alfredo says it was a sacred place. A sacred place. Okay. All, all, all good ones. Anybody else get any other ones on this? Why, why was Jesus so angry? And, and I'd like to suggest that if you're all right, if you're all right on this, I'd like to take it a couple steps further. The text reads, you have turned what? You have turned what? What was it supposed to be? What does it say there? My father's place. You have turned my father's house into what? A market. A market. And in our society, I know there's somebody who's going to say, gee, you say the market like it's a bad thing. Our society, one of the great virtues of our society is what? The free enterprise. market. The free, you know, free enterprise, free market. Now that's something pretty close to something we worship. The free market, as if it were a virtue. The free market. What gets sold in a market, what gets traded in a market, are commodities. Commodities are traded in a market. What I'd like to suggest here is that Jesus was royally angry, divinely angry, because the temple, the sacred place, had been reduced to a market, and God or more specifically, God's favor, God's grace, had been reduced to a commodity. You see, I've heard sermons that say, that, well, Jesus was really angry because the money changers were, were crooked. You know, they were taking too much off the top. Well, they actually were. And I've even heard people say, well, you know, the animals they were trying to sell weren't really pure. They were, they were not really kosher animals. I want to suggest that it's bigger than just a bunch of merchants in the outer courtyard. Because after all, there are merchants everywhere. And if God is angry at somewhat dishonest merchants in the temple courtyard, I would suggest that God is also angry at dishonest merchants everywhere. Unless you sit there, or I sit there, which is much more likely, and being smug, yeah, I hate dishonest merchants, I would remind you that the one who is guilty of even one tiny point of the law is guilty of all of it. And when you point one finger of blame, you know the little aphorism. Three, go point back. Yeah, yeah. I would suggest it's something far deeper than that. You see, it's probably not nice that there are money changers in the temple and that there are all these animals and, oh, imagine the mess. What I want to suggest is that Jesus was angry. Not even so much because there are people selling things. Not even so much because there are people taking advantage of the fact that you had to have the right coins to buy the right animals. But I want to suggest that Jesus was angry at the entire business of the temple. The entire nature of the temple. What purpose did the temple serve? Primarily, what was the purpose of the temple? Well, specifically, folks, the temple's purpose, the primary purpose of the temple was a place where you could bring your sacrifices and slaughter them so that you could be okay with God. The purpose of the temple was, well, let me see, it's 
it's that time of year again. And, and you know, I mean, it's a pretty dangerous world out there. I would prefer that some Roman doesn't come busting down my door, doing all kinds of unmentionable things. I would prefer that they don't come down with some horrible disease like leprosy or something. And the way to ensure that is that God favors me. And the way to ensure God's favor is to make a sacrifice. Maybe like a big sacrifice, especially if I have a lot of money. Or a lot of kids. Or a lot of rich kids. I need to make a big sacrifice. Because I want God's favor. And, and, and I would suggest to you that before we even worry about the psychic violence of believing in a God who demands blood, Oh. 